Um, this, like, uh, like some of the other talks, I'm going to divide this in a couple parts. First, I'm just going to tell you really briefly about some of the things that I do for discussions later on. But then I, I want to make a sort of a general uh, point or maybe even a bit of a provocation about uh, the way that we create instruments, the way that we maintain the instruments that we create and share ideas with one another. Because I think there's a lot of things that we could be doing in this space that would be interesting to explore. Um, so I, I do a lot of work with augmented instruments. Um, one of these is called the Magnetic Resonator Piano. Um, this is a project from a few years ago where I took an acoustic grand piano, put electromagnets inside of it to bow the strings. Um, you know, I think we've you know, seen some examples of uh, electromagnetic uh, work, and I think we'll see some more today. Um, and then another thing about this instrument is that uh, actually it's playable from the keyboard using continuous gesture by way of measuring the continuous key position. So it actually sort of adds a new vocabulary on top of the traditional piano. I'm just going to play you a really short video clip to show you what this is about. I mean, you get the idea of a sort of musical language that it affords uh, you know, very much continuity, sort of uh, flexibility in pitch and in timbre. Um, all of this generated acoustically from the piano strings, not from speakers that are attached to it. Um, from there, I went on to do a different uh, augmented keyboard project, uh, perhaps aiming at a slightly different musical space. Uh, this is called Touch Keys. Um, it's something I'm still working on. It's uh, basically uh, capacitive touch sensors on the surface of the keys. They measure where you place your fingers on the keys. Um, and then you can use that to do things like pitch bends, vibrato, uh, timbre changes, just by moving the fingers on the key surface. So here's a couple uh, little quick examples. Here. flexibly mappable to different things and you know I think there's uh, potentially some interesting spaces to explore in terms of the kind of gestural language and the kind of control that you might get out of that again using that problematic word of control there um, but that's, as much as I want to say about keyboards um, I, so I'm coming around toward a project that's going to take me into the uh, uh, the main topic of this talk um, one of the things that I've done in the past year or two um, is this project called Bella. Uh, this is a, an open source hardware and software platform for creating musical instruments, which uh, came out of a project called Hackable Instruments that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and this is something that I've worked on together with uh, the lab that I run at, uh, within the Center for Digital Music at Queen Mary. Um, and the idea with Bella is basically it's a BeagleBone Black single board computer, um, very much like Raspberry Pi, uh, with a custom hardware cape that goes on the top of it. It gives you audio in and out, 16-bit analog in and out, uh, and some speaker amplifiers. And that's coupled with uh, some, uh, basically a custom software environment that, uh, the key idea here is that it's really, really low latency. I mean, that latency I think is a really important uh, aspect of uh, instrument design and reducing the latency wherever possible can make an instrument uh, more responsive and more reactive to the performer. So we basically come up with a with a new way of uh, taking the going from the audio code to the hardware that gets you down potentially under one millisecond of latency, which is better than you're going to do with any laptop that's out there, and also which samples all your sensor data completely synchronously with the audio. So every sensor input you have can effectively have audio bandwidth. It's exactly aligned with the audio sample, so you really get uh, very much accurate timing and uh, you know, very high reactivity. Um, so, uh, sort of 
geeky summary of features here. Uh, basically, uh, low latency, um, high bandwidth of sensing, and this really like, enables new kinds of interactions, um, reducing jitter, uh, and you know, basically also trying to make a, a very straightforward API that people can use to write code on this, so you don't have to get involved in three days of setting up tool chains just to build Hello World. And I think that's actually extremely important because almost all of us you know, just really simply don't have the time to sit around and mess with compilers for days on end just to get things running. So um, you can program it in C++, or uh, there's an option to use uh, something called heavy audio tools to take PD patches and actually compile them into optimized C code, which will run on the board. So there's you know, a number of ways to get started building instruments, and uh, we're working here uh, with Mariah and with some others on getting SuperCollider to run on the board, and that's really exciting too. So. Um, the, uh, the place that this came from, well, oh, it, uh, I should say, yeah, last month uh, we ran a Kickstarter campaign on this. It's all done. Uh, it, was, it was successful, hooray. Um, and so we're trying to build essentially a large open source community around this. Uh, you know, people who are willing to share ideas and you know, pitch into development and you know, just generally ho hopefully make it a kind of community thing more than just a few people in, in a particular city. Um, I'm actually gonna I'm gonna skip over most of this, but the, the reason that we built this initially was for this instrument called the D-Box, which is uh, uh, and the the interesting thing about the D-Box, I guess primarily is that uh, it is designed to be modified and hacked by the performer. Like this, um, you pop open the side, you get this breadboard, and you can essentially circuit bend the instrument and cause it to create a lot of sounds that we as the designers didn't specify. And there's a whole a whole backstory for that, which I'll. I can tell you later if you're so interested. Um, I'll skip the I'll skip the videos, but I have one of these here, and I can show it later on in the afternoon. Um, I think, in the interest of keeping this moving, let me let me just go to some of the questions that I'd like to put out there. You know, these are by no means only my own. I think a lot of these have been kicking around for a while, but uh, this seems like a great opportunity to dis to discuss some of these things. And one of the things is that. Anyone involved in instrument design is often very much preoccupied with their current project. You know, what's next? What am, what am I building now? Uh, or you know, what am I performing with now? And we accumulate this incredible sort of repertoire of instruments, many of which essentially become sort of uh, forgotten, or you know, they just end up on a shelf somewhere. And there's and this is problematic for a whole bunch of reasons, and it's problematic for musical reasons too. Like if I if I build an instrument that is for my performance, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I can feel play with it for as long as I want, and then I can say, I'm moving on to something else now. But if I build an instrument and I say to somebody else, please will you write me a piece for my instrument, but I give you no guarantee that this instrument will exist in six months, well, a lot of composers are going to say, well, thanks, but you know, I'd rather write a piece for this violinist because I know that that piece is going to have a continuing performance life. You know, at the same time, oftentimes for the instrument to have a reason for you know, continuing to be used, it's very helpful to have a repertoire. So, but there's almost like a sort of unstated contract between the composer and the designer, I think, sometimes, that say the piece has a life, the instrument has a life. How do we do this? So, a question is essentially, how do we archive the designs of digital musical instruments so that they continue to be used in future years? That's a, you know, I think there's, I won't answer that, but it's a question I'll throw out there. Um, it's hard for a variety of reasons. I mean, of course, hardware becomes obsolete and hard to find. Uh, you know, that, you, know, you can even get to a point where you literally cannot buy the parts that are needed to service things. Uh, you know, that happens especially with a lot of old analog designs. Um, but, you know, then a particular kind of DMI problem is the version conflict, right? The, I upgraded to El Capitan and my entire instrument broke and now I can't play. And, you know, but you know, we use the laptop for an instrument, but we also use the same laptop for everything else in our life, and basically keeping all of these things together is incredibly complicated. Um, and oftentimes, you know, also lack of time means lack of time to document things, so later on you come back and you say, how, you know, how did I do that thing again? You have to relearn everything. Um, and if you want to hand it over to somebody else, then you might, they might say, this, this comes from a conversation actually last night at dinner, I think it was Carl, I think it was your, Point of basically, uh, or no, this was a this was a conversation yesterday. It's not that's right. We were talking about uh, um, you know why did why do we make the instrument the way we did? Why not some other way? And so somebody comes along and they say, well, I have this other idea. You want to be able to say, we've already tried that. You know, the reason that we designed it this way is because it works better for the following reasons. So documentation. Um, uh, long story short, a question is, 
how can we maintain these instruments that we create without requiring a personal investment of time for all eternity for the person who made it? Um, something to discuss. And then, related to this, and this is more, more or less the end, um, it would be very useful, I think, to have ways that we can share designs with one another, not in the way that we share open source software now, and we all you know, can work on the same projects in a remote way. This is not as easy when we're talking about physical stuff and interactive objects. And so we end up with you know, a lot of bespoke systems, and sometimes a lot of the same problems solved independently many times in many different places. Um, so the question is, are there ways that we can make instrument sharing more usable? Would it be a good idea to have standard platforms? I mean, you, I mean obviously you can see I have some, something of an interest in this, but I'm not proposing my own tools as the answer to any of these questions. But you know, there might be downsides if we say, you know, standard platform is inevitably not going to work for everyone. So. But, you know, what can we do to have more exchange of ideas? Um, and this is the last slide. Uh, so, there is a workshop that uh, several, uh, that I'm one of several organizers for at uh, NIME this year. Uh, this, this idea we're calling NIME Hub, uh, some sort of repository for, for musical instruments. And the idea would be, you know, some way of archiving and sharing complete design information uh, for, uh, for instrument building and, you know, uh, there's just a lot of questions about the sort of form of this, so it would be very interesting to get input on, you know, is it a good idea at all? Uh, you know, to what extent do you want to say things should be standardized versus anything goes? Uh, you know, and how will it be maintained, etc. So, I, I put this out there for discussion. Thank you. Yeah.